Freddie March Memorial Trophy. We are celebrating 75 years here at Racing Goodwood. It's underway and it's a good start from the pole man, Alex Bunker, who really gets off the line extremely well. That's perfect. That's how you want it to be. The number 66 car launches into the lead and everybody now chasing time to find a spot that they can go through. Yeah, it's all nice and clean. Everyone got away nicely, Ben, which is great to see. But look at the lead that Buncombe's got already. He's streaming down the back straight through Ford Water, down to St Mary's. Several cars jostling, put position, but he's gone. He's not even the second place car is in sight, and that is the Wilson Bradley car that's yeah. managed to get past the Webb and Ward. That's right, so the outside of the front row worked well for Richard Wilson. He's got up into second place, and then you've got the, the battles going on further back, and Nigel Webb is trying to defend busily. He started second, but he's actually under a lot of pressure in uh, further yet yeah, third place under two cars who are trying to get past him there. The number 74, that's Martin Hunt in the HWM Jaguar. And in between them, you've got the 56 car of Gregor Fiskin, the car he's sharing with Jake Hill. And Gregor was very quick in qualifying too. And Gregor Fiskin looking to move on to the inside. The number 56, the pale green, HWM Jaguar. Can he make the move? Oh, not quite yet. No, the doors firmly closed. Shall be very brave. He's having a little look. He's going to get the switch back. Yeah, fantastic job getting it sideways. So Jake Hill will be very pleased with that. And he's pulled a slight gap already going into this last game. Oh, they can have both of No. Number 74 having a little look. Hunt having a little look down the inside. But thought better of it, which I think was the right decision. But as you said, it was a great start by Alex Buncombe, who's got a comfortable lead over Richard Wilson. Then Gregor Fiskin sharing the car with Jake Hill. Gregor's gone up into third position in the HWM. There you are looking at the number 29 car, that is Nigel Greensill, as I mentioned. I thought he might be able to make a few places. He's not actually made a lot of ground. I think he's actually where he started from. He's still in ninth position currently in that little battle group. And... We shall see as it goes. We know that Jake Hill is going to be taking over from Gregor Fiskin later on in this race. But as you said, he will be happy to have seen what Gregor has managed to do on that opening lap to get up into third position. Yeah, he'll go, phew, that helps my job a little bit better. And that's what you want, your, your driver that starts the race, to keep it clean and try and make... Uh, men's move forward up the road, which he certainly has. We've got some big movers further down. We've got the number 82 car, Reading and the Brigade, that have made four spots. Wow. They've up into 14th place at the moment. And the number 11 car as well has made seven places. Right, now we've been told it is a 50-minute race. It has been shortened a little bit, so it's not a full hour, but it's still a decent distance. But that... Yeah, the Gary Pearson Alex Brundle car has definitely uh, made some good progress. Uh, the number four car, as we're looking at a, another little battle, this is for seventh position, actually, um, as they're coming through. I think, I think it's actually got ahead of these guys. So dropping back a little bit now is Nigel Webb, who started from the front row, the number 55 car, but definitely losing a bit of time. He's down into fifth place and being chased hard by the number 520 as well. That's uh, Gary Harmon in the Cooper Jaguars through. He's having Five. a very close battle there with Darren Turner, isn't he? Yeah. Swapping for position, but hats off to Alex Buncombe. He, he's off the 5.5 seconds clear of the Wilson and Bradley car in P2, but we've got a right good battle here now, haven't we, for fifth place? Definitely, it's working out uh, pretty strongly. Nigel Webb just hanging on in there, number 55, trying to come around the outside. Is Darren Turner, as you mentioned. Darren, number three, right around the outside. Yes, he gets past one. Can he get past the other? That's the question. Darren, so experienced, so talented. We've seen over the years, Le Mans class winner a couple of times for Aston Martin, of course, a long-term Aston Martin driver. And this is an Aston Martin DB3S that was such a star car here at Goodwood back in period. Yeah, and I'm, a, I'm guessing he's timed it to perfection, and he has, getting a great exit out of the back corner. Now it is pretty much a drag race all the way up the slightly uphill straight all the way to Woodgut Corner. He's pulled out a slight bit of a gap. He's going to hit the brakes. Again, the tricky corner. You can see flames spitting out the back, but further back in the picture there, Ben, is the number 520 being passed. Is it round the outside of the Pearson and Brundle car? Yeah, Gary Pearson's in that car at the moment, and that's, that's a, a good sign because we did wonder why it had been slow in the qualifying. They obviously 
uh, did have a problem with the car, and it's now working much more likely, because both Gary Pearson and Alex Brundle are very rapid drivers, normally they're right up front, but it's beginning to get nearer and nearer the front, this car, so it's the slightly lighter coloured car, just going through the shot, as you saw, has made up a good number of places now, the Gary Pearson, Alex Brundle car, with Gary in it right now, and, and definitely gaining some lost time. Meanwhile, also moving up the order a bit, Joe Wilmot in the Jaguar XK140 GOM, as it's called, number 84. Yeah, so that, that Brundle and Pearson car started in 14th to already seven places gained. So Alex Brundle will be smiling like a Cheshire cat on the, the pit wall and desperate to, to get in as the 520, oh, the number seven just there, kicking up some dust on the outside. But this scrap is not over, is it, Ben, for, for this sixth place? Definitely not. No, this is good fun. And Gary Pearson is now going to lose that place back again. So the number four car just dropped behind uh, Gary Harmon in the number 520, who is now putting the pressure on Nigel Webb, who can he hold off or not? I'm not sure he can, because the, the 520 is really flying along. The Cooper Jaguar, big, quite a lumpy looking machine. It did get some damage earlier, but it is running okay, as Gary Pearson also nips through at the same time. And then you've got the little blue Cooper Climax behind them. That's a little mid-engine car, much smaller engine, one of the first of the mid-engine sports cars, that little blue car, number seven there. But it's it's got great pace, considering it's got a 1,500cc engine up against really quite powerful machinery around it. Yeah, I have to say, looking at going through the chicane, it looks pretty nimble. looks pretty good handling-wise. So, because we've got such an array of cars, they all have different benefits around the circuit. Some will be faster in a straight line, some will have better traction, some will be faster through the corners. And certainly that number seven looks pretty handy through the corners. It does, it's looking uh, very entertaining indeed. We'll see how it goes. Now, the pit window uh, has been opened up between 16 minutes and 34 minutes. So 16 minutes into the race, they are allowed to start making their pit stop. So we're a little bit off that so far. We're uh, seven, just over seven minutes into the race currently, because it's now a 50 minute race. So a little bit of time yet before the pit lane opens up, but we don't need it. We've got some great battles still going on here. Yeah, we don't. And some days you, you want the pit window to open and others you don't. This is one of those times that we don't want the pit window to open. We've got a great scrap here. Now for eighth place, it's been raging on and on and on, hasn't it? But meanwhile, out front, we're still waiting. He's crossed the line with Alex Buckham, but we're waiting for the Wilson Bradley car. 8.4 seconds is the gap now uh, in the lead between the first and second place. Gosh, that really is a big gap, as you say. Looking at that lovely Allard, uh, that's number 77 I'm talking about there. That's Nick Jarvis driving it. It's called an Allard J2X. That's got a big, big engine in it, so it's it's great comparison to the little Cooper that's up ahead of it, which has a tiny engine. The Allard has a, a big engine. It's nearly six litres, up against a 1,500cc. Uh, so it's got the straight line speed in theory. It might get through, but no, because the Cooper can break so much later going into the corners. Yeah, and the Cooper's getting really good exits, actually. It's very neat and tiny going through the chicane there. But obviously, you know, you have to drag your drive so you go, right, OK, I'm not fastest in a straight line so what's the thing i've got to try and maximize is carrying that speed and getting the exit so great job there from felix who's a wheel of the number seven yeah yeah felix got on yeah as you say the brakes don't have to be on for too long we saw the lights come on there briefly um but it's all about momentum can he carry the momentum in that car or is it going to be a challenge we've got the at the back of that group is the jaguar xk 140 was a special built car in 1954 and we shall see how it goes uh, for that little group but this is a great little group that's going on so far up front as you mentioned there's no doubt about alex buncombe's lead he's still opening up he's still doing some fabulous lap times but further down the order here this is the fight for ninth place and it's still to be decided certainly has been a bit of a drop back for nigel webb in the number 55 car at the front of this little trio having started from the front row but chris ward was the man who set the pace in qualifying in this car and we've seen chris's incredible performance in other cars today as well yeah certainly have Definitely a driver that can 
can show the way around here as again pulling out of the slipstream foot to the floor is the number 77 car not quite close enough almost the like of repeat of the previous lap deja vu going on there you see a little wiggle there from the the cooper climax who's just trying to grab on to the rear end of the number 55 and, and, and try and pressure into a mistake but it looks like at the moment that the 55 car is being driven quite beautifully and making no mistakes at the moment. Yeah, and it's so lovely. I mean, this really gives us an image of, of how the design of cars was changing because mid-engine became the thing. You know, they learned that putting the engine behind the driver made a, a car faster. Oh, big slide from the Allard there in the background. Wondered if he was going to hold it. Just about managed to do so. So well done to Nick Jarvis. That was a good job. But yes, going mid-engine was the way to go. But at this time, of course, up against big, powerful front-engine cars, you get a, a, a real battle between them. There's a, a slightly uh, more unusual car going through as well. Uh, that's a bit further down the order, actually. That one's uh, being lapped, one of the cars down towards the back of the field. But this is the group that's still battling for positions in the top 10. Yeah, it is. So it's Nigel Webb behind the wheel of the 55, who's doing, as I said, a, a good job. Oh, yeah, even more of a wiggle through the Cooper climate. So he's absolutely trying to, to wring the neck, is Felix. And he's a little bit closer, but again, he won't quite have the straight line speed. So will the back marker come into play? I doubt it. Uh, but the Cooper Climax is going to be hoping that it stays out the way it does. So it hasn't affected this this sort of battle going into turn one. No, it's a good point, though, because once you get into the back markers, it can often be a, a, either a big help or a big hindrance, can't it can't in terms of making an overtake. Yeah, it certainly can. So we've got some lap cars that are down to roughly about 18th place, I think 20th place at the moment. But the number 56 car... Currently third. The, the Fiskin and Hill, so both are doing a, a good job. Like I said, Jake will be very pleased with that. Started in fourth place, made up one position, now in third. Yeah, third place for them. So Jake Hill will be looking forward to taking that over. Um, but uh, dropping back a little bit, some six seconds behind the second place car of Richard Wilson, and that is the Maserati 250S that's in second. This third, this third place car is the HWM Jaguar, a car that uh, would take victories. Uh, Crystal Palace had won in 1953, so there you go, another 70-year anniversary since it had a, an important victory with Tony Gaze. Uh, Peter Collins was also uh, a successful driver in this car. Peter, of course, another star uh, driver in the 50s and 60s, and, um, well, they 50s anyway, and... Uh, he was also a driver of this car in period. It's going well, holding on to third place, but I tell you what, the leader, Alex Bunker, is just disappearing. And considering he's going to be handing over to Jensen Button. <laughs> uh, it's a deadly combination. He's already 19 seconds in the lead, but just looking, I'm not sure it's a timing error, but the Pearson and Brundle car, the number four, Jaguar C-Type is dropping down the order. Uh. It's pulled out, apparently. Oh, that's a great shame, because it obviously had a trouble earlier on today. There there you are, he's just pulled off. Oh, because it was it had made a good recovery, hadn't it? Yeah, very good recovery. I was looking forward to seeing Alex Brundle jump in to the car and see what he could do behind the wheel. As a flash of the lights there from the number 56. Uh, I don't know if there was traffic there, or it was just a, just a cheeky flash of the lights for, for no reason, but... Uh, yeah, that's a big, big shame. Maybe we should give Alex a, uh, a shout to come and join us in the commentary booth. We both work with Alex in the commentary world. And uh, he's not more than happy He's to, not going to sure. drive the car. So, Alex, come and join us in the booth. It'd be lovely to see you. <laughs> but uh, I'm sorry that he's not going to get a, a chance to, to go out and play in that one. He has got uh, plenty of other things to drive over the course of the weekend, of course. So, we are only, um, um, what, just over a minute away from the pit lane opening up, uh, just under two minutes actually from the pit lane opening up, so we'll see how quickly they decide to swap, uh, quite often it is the faster, more professional drivers that are, are waiting in the pits to be taking over for the second part, I would imagine for example that Nigel Webb, who is sharing with Chris Ward, may well make quite an early pit stop in the number 55 car. Yeah, I would say so. It's a very tight pit lane, isn't it? And 
and that's the problem when it, you want to come in, you want to make your driver change, there's not much space to do it. And now, yeah. moving forward, is the number 77 car. The Allard has uh, picked off the number 55, but the little climax is coming back. Yeah, the Cooper just dived back past again, which is lovely to see, as you say. But they have both now got past the car that started from the front row. And as I mentioned, Nigel Webb, I think he'll be coming in pretty early to hand it over to Chris Ward. Now, I'm not sure the pit lane will be open when he next comes around. It'll be nearly open, actually. Close. Yeah, it'll be pretty close uh, close. to be able to do that. But this ever so close to, to the grass there. Sorry, Ben. Yeah, no, I saw that. Yeah, you're right. Very, very tight. We've got uh, oh, another side-by-side -side action here. Oh, wheel on the grass. Don't get too carried away. And also joining in all the fun and games is the Ferrari TRC, the 500 TRC, Scott Redding. He's at the wheel of that at the moment, a bit further down than uh, hoped for, but doing okay. Yeah, and that's given Nigel a little bit of breathing space in the number 55, and it's Joseph Wilmot that's at the wheel of the number 84 at the moment, as the Ferrari has uh, made place. And there, look, in the box at the bottom of your screen, we can see driver changes have began already. Yeah, just as the, it's opened up. So the pit lane is officially open now. They're seeing uh, a few of those cars beginning to, to come in for the swap overs. Number 78 in there, Richard Wilson and Richard Bradley making an early switch over. And they are front runners in this, so we'll see how this goes. Yeah, we saw some great shots, didn't we, earlier on in the practice session, the qualifying practice of Richard Bradley really ragging the neck of this Maserati. And here is the leader in, so Bumpkin's in, and we're going to get a great shot of the onboard camera there as he slings himself out of the car. Johnson Button will hop in. Quick adjustment of the belts, making sure he's not going to sit on a belt. That can be extremely uncomfortable as he slides into position now. He looks very small there in the cockpit, doesn't he? <laughs> That's right. And although they get on with it, and they do it as quick as possible, there is a minimum time they have to be in the pit. So you can't just do it as fast as possible and go straight out. You have to then wait, be told by your crew when you've been in there long enough. He's just caught his radio cable there, and it's not quite on his hands device either, is the belt. So that, oh, I was going to say, you probably need to pull that radio cable out, but they've left it in. Maybe Jensen will try and give it a little bit of tug out when he, he leaves the, the pits. Now Jake Hill's going to take over this car from Gregor Fiskin, and this is running in third place. So let's see how this goes as Jensen Button gets going now. So he's, he's done it. He's got a reminder on the steering wheel. <laughs> Pit speed, 20 miles an hour. Yeah, I mean, uh, th there's no speedos on that one. It doesn't actually look like it's working. So he's going to have to judge 20 mile an hour. It'll be a lot slower than anything that he's he's used to. As he lights the rear wheels, heads out the pits. Jake Hill still getting strapped in now. So this is an important time to have a smooth pit stop. That was a very professional one. I love the way they put those little signs on the steering wheel just to remind the driver of exactly what matters on the pit stop. And uh, Jensen is immediately on the case. He's being chased by that lovely little Cooper uh, that we've been watching and enjoying. Now, Jake Hill, the touring car star, is now heading out. He's a Goodwood star as well, of course, in this lovely little 56 machine, the uh, HWF Jaguar of 1954. So, what can he do? Is there any chance of catching Jensen Button? I think that's a bit of a tall order because they've got such a big lead. They have got such a big lead, but on track lead, not necessarily overall because of the pit stops, is the number three, Darren Turner, yet to, to come into the pits. But we're riding on board with Jensen Button, who's uh, as pro as ever, quickly got used to hopping into a different car, doing a pit stop. A little bit of vibration there on the steering wheel, it looks like it, from our, our onboard camera, but that won't hinder him whatsoever as he comes up the very very long straight now and he'll hit the brakes going into woodcut jaguar c-types were wonderful cars at the time they were long winners in 1951 and in 1953 for jaguar and in fact um, a jaguar c-type one of them all at a an average speed of over 100 miles an hour for the first time, that was the first time 100 miles an hour, had been uh, beaten by the Jaguar C-Types. They started out with about 180 horsepower, went up to about 220 horsepower, but in modern days now, even with those same engines, they're getting a fair bit more horsepower than that out of them, with a bit of modern uh, understanding of how to make them work. Yeah, we certainly, certainly are. So this car currently holds the fastest lap of the race. That one, unfortunately, for the 
for the climax for Jensen Button. And set by Alex Bunker, 128.9. There we go. A little puff of smoke there Ooh. out of the, the side. Or was that just my item? Was that a car peeling off to the right-hand side going through St Mary's? Or again, was that my eyes? Well, we'll have to keep an eye on that. Um, the race leader of this race at the moment is actually Darren Turner because, of course, uh, they haven't made a pit stop yet. So Darren Turner in car number three is the current race leader. And then we've got the number 520, Gary Harmon, in the Cooper Jaguar, currently in second place. But then you've got Jensen Button in third, having made the pit stop with a comfortable advantage over everybody else that uh, was racing before the pit stop started. So that's why we're focusing on Jensen. He is effectively the race leader, even though officially right now he isn't because Darren Turner is the official race leader and of course you never know what can happen in a race if you get a, an incident or something then making a pit stop then will cost you less time but right now it's looking very composed for Jensen Button let's just see very composed he's driving out with his eyes open <laughs> he does a 131.9 um, so that's an impressive lap time it's not as quick as his teammate was early on but it's still impressive now, the man who did such a great job in that first in, of course, was Alex Buncombe, and Ed Foster's with him. Al, uh, as, as first stints go, that surely was the dream first stint. Yeah, it certainly was. You know, I haven't started this car for over 10 years now, so a little bit apprehensive off the line. Um, actually, on the green flag lap, me and Nigel had exactly the same start, so I was like, I'm going to have to up my game when it's the real start. So, um, yeah, I didn't want to over the start. And, yeah, I managed to get the lead to turn one and then just wanted to get my head down. But the track seems really greasy out there. I don't know why. I found that a little earlier in the Cobra. It just didn't, just overall, just felt generally quite low grip out there. I don't know why. Maybe quite a lot of oil down or something. But the car's going excellent. Um, yeah, like you say, dream sort of start to the race. Handed over to Jensen in a really good spot. So hopefully he can just keep the car nice and consistent. Is it worse waiting here watching Jensen or waiting for the start that you're doing yourself? Yeah, of course it is. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to jinx anything, but we're looking good at the moment. But you know, they're historic cars, and you know, anything can go wrong. But um, car felt fine when I got out, so nice and consistent. Um, unfortunately, I didn't know what sort of lap times I was doing because the the guys changed the the race logic in the car to the actual speed, and they thought they'd done it for just the pits, but it was actually the whole lap. So I had no idea of my pace, but you know, I just. Go off my gap to, to B2, but um, yeah, it's looking good at the moment. Great drive, well done. Thank you, kid. Cheers, guys. Yeah, well done to Alex. Great job. And Jensen Button's just cruising along. He's uh, he's lapping a little slower than the fastest lap that Alex Buncan did set, but they're they're in a good shape, so they don't need to be pushing too hard. Well, you're exactly right. They don't need to be setting purple sectors, do they? You don't want to put anything at risk with the gap that they've got to the cars behind. So uh, that is the. The Wilson Bradley car that you could say is technically in second place. So uh, Jensen just needs to keep it nice and tidy. But as Alex reminded us there, that this is historic racing, so anything can happen. Yeah, yeah. And, and Jensen's had mechanical problems in cars that when he's been leading. I, I saw that later last year. So it doesn't. He knows it doesn't always go exactly to plan. But as the light starts to drop here, what a wonderful view we've got. Celebrating a, an event that used to be a nine-hour race here at Goodwood between 3 p.m. in the afternoon and midnight. This is normally a one-hour race. It's ended up being a 50-minute race, or will be, because of the uh, the changes. Now, this is the current leader coming in. So Darren Turner is now heading into the pits, and he's going to be handing over to Simon Hatfield. Simon will be quick as well, so a good chance. But we do know that this is a big gap, and this is effectively going to bring the lead back to Jensen Button once these guys come back out again. Yeah, Darren Turner, a pro, of course, racing in Le Mans, and he's done plenty of pit stops in his time. So as Simon jumps in the car now, we can see Darren's whipping the helmet off. We'll be relieved to have some fresh air. It's open cockpit, of course, so it won't be nowhere near as warm as racing and in cockpit, but Simon looks all set and ready to go. I'd say that's a pretty clean pit stop there. Yeah, that went smoothly, didn't it? Um, we've still got 25 and a half minutes to go in this session. Lights coming on on some of the cars, but out in front with a comfortable advantage right now. It is Jensen Button. And if you look at that list you've got top left of the screen there, the car that's uh, effectively closest to them is actually in third place because that has made a pit stop. 
whereas the car currently running in second place, the pretty little Cooper Climax, that has not made its pit stop yet, so it is officially second now, but once it's made its pit stop, of course, it's going to drop back a little more. That's been a part of the game. Meanwhile, Jake Hill, of course, trying to close up some of that gap himself, currently running in fourth position and putting in, I think, some decent lap times. Just have a little look at uh, his lap times here, 31-0 last time around. But uh, indeed, Richard Wilson and Richard Bradley, actually it's Richard Bradley in Richard the car Bradley's now. The car. Yeah, he's in the 29s, isn't he? He is, and actually that gap has, I've been keeping an eye on the gap, and it's become slowly coming down and down, so the gap is, time-wise, there's two seconds between Jensen Button's pace and uh, Richard Bradley's pace. As we can see, the cli climax will be bleeding into the pit lane now. Nice job for, for raising the hand there, just to letting know your competitors around you that you're coming into the pit. So Felix now brings in the car and a change will begin. Yeah, Christian will take over. So the two Goddards uh, swapping over here in their pretty little car. And he's done a, a great job. I thought Felix did a, a really nice job in that stint, competing in what is a, a small engine car. Doesn't look the easiest thing to get in and out. No, it, it's odd having a sports car with the central seat. Yeah, isn't it? but a uh, great car, as you said, and actually a really, really good job by by Felix. As we've touched on already, not the fastest car in the field, but looks pretty nimble. Flashing the lights there, just making sure the controls are working properly. As a good teamwork there to strap uh, strap him in. Double check to see if uh, everything's okay, and he'll be on his way. Yeah, it's a lovely car, as you say. In its period, in the, between 1955 and 1962, the Cooper Climax T39s, they, they took 90 victories. There were plenty of them, of course, all around uh, UK, Europe, and into the States. But 90 victories they took. They were absolutely dominant. It was the beginning of mid-engines, and it was Jack Brabham who raced for Cooper, who converted one into an F1 car, basically. And F1 started to go mid-engined as a result of the re, uh, performances of those little Cooper Climax sports cars. So it was such a, a key beginning. And uh, they've shown as well in this race how they go up against these big, powerful front-engine cars and be truly competitive. But no one's quite got the pace of this car, this beautiful Jaguar, with Jensen Button at the wheel. He's consistently in the 1 minute 31s. And although that's not quite as rapid as Alex did a 28.9 on his best lap, in that first stint, it's just about controlling it and looking after it. It is, and uh, that gap's still coming down though, so Richard Bradley is uh, really pushing the Maserati to its limit. Uh, it looks like Jensen is doing that same, similar thing, but the gap is coming down. It was considerably bigger, wasn't it, when Alex Bunker come into the pit, so Richard Bradley, who we know here, is very, very fast, and already looking at the first sector times, will be half a second up already on this lap. Now we're on board with Jay Kittle here. Now he's running in third position currently, and he's also trying to gain some of that, uh, that ground, but it's quite a long way back in third place, but he's got cars to lap and get past, and get through them as quickly as possible. That's all part and parcel of it. He's got a, he's, he's quite lonely there, I would have to say, in third <laughs> position, because he's got a 29-second gap between the Turner and Hatfield car, but he's got a little bit of traffic, and that is an added challenge to, to try and pass these, because I'm sure, I'm sure at the members' meeting we, uh, we commentated on some races where there was incidents with lapped cars uh, and the, the lead cars, but uh, Jake's experience as he is ever so sideways, showing off his car control, he must know that we're currently riding on board with him. It's a lovely view, though, and it's great having the onboard cameras. You see things that you just don't see on board in in much motor racing, the car keys hanging in there with some spares. Lovely. Uh, You've got the tag on it. <laughs> exactly. And there, there's the car that you were mentioning that's going really well at this stage, being driven by Richard Bradley. Um, so gradually actually closing the gap to Jensen Button. Now, it's still a decent gap of nearly seven seconds, but he is lapping quickly all the time. Yeah, he has got the upper hand in the first... Uh, first sector, they're fairly evenly matched in the middle sector, but then Richard's got the upper hand on Jensen in the final sector, so that gap is creeping down and down and down, and you can see Richard is a really working hard on the wheel, the driver that I raced up against in karting was extremely fast, he is the 2010 Formula BMW Pacific Champion as well, so he's got great experience behind him.
but he is pushing that car to the absolute limit. And actually, that lap, that time around, he was slightly quicker in the middle sector as he comes into Woodcock Corner now, fully sideways, taking the car all the way to the end of the track on the brakes, bleed it in through the chicane, and we'll have a little look at what the time will be when he comes across the line. But Jensen Button has gone slightly faster, so he's picking up the pace right. now is Jensen. He's gone into the 130s, but as I say that, Richard Bradley sets a personal best, and he's in the 129. Wow, that's great. So he's got it down to only just over six seconds now. So he is still just closing the gap bit by bit, Richard Bradley. As you say, he's got a great... Uh, heritage in, in motorsport of what he's done in sports car racing um, and other forms and he started out in single seaters and actually he took his first win here at Goodwood um, in the members meeting earlier this year that was the Nuvolari trophy in the Aston Martin speed model Red Dragon that was his first win here at Goodwood um, so he, he is uh, looking for another one if he can try and close up the gap to Jensen but that six second gap with what have we got? 19 minutes to go. That's a challenge. It is a challenge, but it's it is possible. It's certainly possible. They've pretty much matched each other in the first sector. Um, traffic again can come to over. You don't get the the, the smooth side of the traffic, uh, and you have to overtake and really slow yourself down into corners, and your competitor gets the, the good side of the traffic and ends up just breezing past them in the straight. That can come into play as well. Yeah, well, let's see. I mean, it's not impossible. The, 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 the pace difference between them does make it possible still. Can he get it under six seconds on this lap? Let's keep an eye on Jensen. So, race leader here, you're watching Jensen Button, 2009 Formula One world champion in his Jaguar C Type. He goes over the line, and in the background, we're waiting for the Maserati to come over the line, and the gap is, it is coming down. It's down to 5.6. It's coming down. It's always that final sector. Richard's very, very good in that final sector. He keeps finding time of time, and I noticed, remember Alex said that the uh, the track seemed quite slippy, so I wonder if the track's improving, because we could see all down in that final sector at Woodcut, Cor uh, Woodcut Corner, didn't we? So I wonder if the track's slowly improving, but Richard, Got fairly lucky loop there with the traffic, passing the car on the exit. But then again, so, so did De Jensen. So uh, <laughs> I'm going to keep a, a close eye on the on these sector times. No, absolutely. You keep an eye on that because this is actually intriguing me now as to whether uh, Richard Bradley here, you're looking at him now, in the number 78 Maserati. This is a, a very rare car, but it's also jolly fast. It's a 2.4 litre straight six. Um, they, they, Maserati increased the engine size uh, for the 250S as opposed to the 200S. They only made a couple of them, but they were winners uh, in their in their years in the 1950s. And Maserati, of course, was a tremendous racing company anyway. Um, Maserati and Jaguar were, were often racing against each other for big wins, and we've got it again today. That Jaguar C-Type with Jensen Button up against the Maserati 250 of Richard Wilson. Two incredible names in the sport, but Richard Bradley's got the carrot. He can see the carrots, can't he now? Right up there in the distance. And Jensen's gained some time in that last sector, but nothing Look compared at the lap to time Richard between, Bradley. Look at the lap time between. So, so Jensen's done a 130.071. Bradley did a 1 minute 30.070. There was one thousandth of a second between them. Yeah, so Richard lost a little bit of time in that first sector. And uh, I, Jensen, I'm sure Jensen knows, he's probably giving us a false hope here of a great battle towards the end. He's probably saying, well, I don't, there's still five seconds. I don't need to push, I don't need to risk anything. But saying that, Richard Bradley, look at that first sector, Ben, on our timing screen. Six tenths quicker than Jensen. Jensen, OK, had a slightly bit of traffic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as we were saying earlier, this could be fundamental because I know when we've been commentating on these races before, sometimes it's when they catch traffic and get it at just the wrong moment. One car can lose much more time than the other. Exactly. And when you're approaching that traffic, you go, please, can you either just slow down a little bit or speed up a little bit, depending where they are on the track. And again, it's a good chunk of time that Richard is quicker in that middle sector. And, and because of the long straights here in the sector and where the sectors are, let's say if you catch someone going into Ford water, then you can make, lose a lot of time heading into that next sector down the straight. The challenge is getting past this next car. It's actually quite a quick car. That car's running in eighth place. So the number 520, which we saw in that big battle earlier on. So 
So Nick Ferber is in it now. Um, it's actually quite a quick car, so he's got to find a way past. Look, what's the gap now? 3.8 seconds is the gap. Is he going to just try and sneak down the inside? Blue flags will be out. So that was nicely done, nicely timed there by Richard Bradley. And there's a little bit of more traffic in front of him. I'm guessing that'll be the 77 car. Jensen's cleared that car at the moment. But again, Richard Bradley setting the pace in that first sector. He certainly is. This is uh, impressive stuff. And he, died, he timed that pass so perfectly. He didn't lose any time at all by getting past at that stage. In the meantime, in third place, we've still got Jake Hill, but he's quite a long way back. He is uh, 16 seconds behind this car, 19 seconds behind the race leader. Again, he's oh, got to get through here. He's got through. Yep, yeah, good job. I was uh, squirming in my seat because you just never know if the car that you're overtaking is seeing you down the inside. Yeah, you see the, see the blue flags. But uh, pit window is now closed, by the way, so no one can come into the pits. Everyone, I think, has pretty much done all their driver changes, I, I'm assuming. Yeah, the only one that didn't, of course, was the Pearson Brundle car, which stopped on, on, on yeah. the track, sadly, so Alex never got a chance to play. But uh, we still have a battle up front, there's no doubt about it. Um, and we shall see what the gap is next time around. Meanwhile, there are other little groups going on here. You're looking at battle for fourth position. So the number three car currently in fourth, but not for very long, because the number 11 car is almost coming through. That's being driven by Sam Hancock now in the Jaguar C-Type number 11. And Sam is definitely picking up a few places here as we go through the rest of the race. And they're also uh, racing up, uh, up against, in fact, the, the, the little seven car is going a bit slower now. That's dropped back. That's down to 11 position. That's not in the same group anymore. And we've got number 78 and number 11. So that is ah. one of the cars on the screen under investigation. Yeah, but 70, that is important because that's Richard Bradley. And I did wonder, when they made their pit stop, I wondered if that was a fraction before the pit window opened. It was very quick, wasn't it? Which is going to be a big shame for us. And yeah. it's a big shame for them if they happen to do get penalty because the gap's now down to 2.8 seconds. <laughs> 2.8. I mean, I'm not sure what the penalty is. Let's say it is five seconds, uh, which in other racing series you usually get a five or a ten second penalty. We won't mention the, the, the championship, but you know what it is. He's he's lapping very quick. It's, it's around about a second a lap quicker at the moment than Jensen Button. And you can see he's, he's near enough right on the back of him now. But there is an investigation on that number 78 car. Look how close it's coming into Jensen Button. I think he's got a real chance to get past Jensen's car. just not going as quick as it was earlier on. As they go across the line, it's down to point two of a second. He's going to have a look into the first corner. We have a change of lead. Jensen Button drops down to second place as Richard Bradley takes the lead in the Freddie March Memorial Trophy. But is he going to be able to hold it? There is a pit stop infringement investigation currently being taken. And I suppose it's not impossible. Jensen might have been told that and told, don't worry. Oh, that's a funny noise. Oh, very good. I was just wondering if there is a problem because he was in the 130s, nearly in the 129s not longer. He's now in the 132s. So that doesn't sound very healthy at all, does it? No, there's a lot of shake, a lot of rattle. Let's listen in here. There's a misfire. Misfire, yeah. Yeah, you're right. Just uh, as it starts to rev a little more, you'll hear it again here, I think. He's having to change up early, isn't he? Yeah, he's actually lifting on the straight now because he's worried about that misfire. Yeah, so that is, that is a real big shame, and he is losing a lot of time in these sectors so that is huge frustration for jensen and alex big disappointment but as you as you mentioned the number 78 is under investigation it all just depends on what the penalty is Absolutely. Well, uh, this is fascinating. I do feel for Jensen because every time he's like leading races by a long, long way, he does seem to have mechanical problems with his cars here at Goodwood. It's so unusual in his professional life. He's always been actually very good at looking after cars and not uh, wearing them out like some drivers do, I don't think. Uh, he's a very smooth driver. He doesn't tend to put too much 
uh, strain on them, but it's just not coming together. And I, I wonder if this is going to give Jake Hill a chance to close up that gap himself. Uh, he's doing about the same lap time, though, isn't he? Yeah, I wonder if Jake got a little bit of traffic because he was lapping a little bit faster in the 131s, 132s, so they're both floating in the 133s, but that could give him a chance. But... Uh, Alex Wonkham called it, he said it's historic racing and anything can happen and unfortunately it's uh, just just shown how, uh, how that certainly can be the case. So the rattle, the misfire continues on Jensen Button's car and it's a, it's a tough feeling when you're driving a car that you know is not fully healthy. He'll be uh, in a slightly anxious situation. Number 74, that's in sixth place, just going through. So that's being driven by Pat Blakeney Edwards now, who is uh, very much a star of Goodwood. Pat Blakeney Edwards, very experienced, historic racer. He's chasing down the number three car, Simon Hatfield now driving the number three car that Darren Turner was in earlier on, the Aston Martin DB3. Aston Martin DB3 was such a successful car here at Goodwood in those nine-hour races. Now we know what the penalty is. So tell me what it is, Alice, the penalty. So car 78, which you could say was our race leader, is a 10-second penalty, and car 11 as well. So that puts Button and Bunkham back in the lead, but it's not going to be for very long. The gap technically is five seconds, but uh, the pace difference now is, uh, is quite considerable. So uh, I still think, and I don't want to commentators curse it for the Bradley and Wilson car, but uh, we still expect that to... to come down the gap quite dramatically and uh, they will slot back into first place. Meanwhile, uh, Hatfield versus Blakeney Edwards here. The, these two are going to be side by side, virtually coming down to the end of the straight. Not quite, so Hatfield's got just enough straight line speed to keep Blakeney Edwards behind him. But Blakeney Edwards is not going to hold back for long with the HWM Jaguar as it chases after the Aston Martin. So uh, the Aston Martin certainly has good straight line speed, but the... Uh, other one seems to have some good cornering speeds as well. Another of the little Coopers in the mix there. That's down in 10th position, and they've got these other cars all rattling around them. So some of these are being lapped, and some of them are racing against each other. It all gets quite complicated at stages and quite busy out there. Yeah, it certainly does. This is great racing between these cars, and it, the penalty did affect the number 11, which is the Jaguar C-type of... Uh, Frederick Wakeman and Sam Hancock, but they're all setting good lap times compared to those around him. Actually, that last oh, lap. Jensen Button's in. Jensen Button is retiring. So I tell you what, Richard Bradley may still win this race, even with the penalty, because Jake Hill is a long way back. Once you apply the penalty, he's 11 seconds back. But what a shame for Jensen and for the crew. We'll no doubt find out more later. He's explaining what he's been feeling. Yeah, we can't quite hear what, it, what the guys are saying, but such a shame. Such a shame. And there we go. And this car is now back in the lead, even with the penalty. So the penalty was for coming into the pits a fraction too early. And they get that 10-second penalty, but they've now got an advantage. Uh, the other penalty that was given out to the number 11 car, which is actually up there, but with the penalty is being pushed back out of a potential podium. Uh, so that's a bit of a tricky one. Maybe they could still get a podium. But no, that... I think they can. Their lap okay. times, if you look, they're in the 131s, and uh, Hunt and Blake the Edwards car are in the one... Uh, well, they were in the 136s, but they popped up in the 133s, but it's going to be close. Sorry, Ben. No, that's right. They got a penalty there for actually their, their pit lane stop, I believe, rather than for coming in too early. So it's just a, it was a slightly different reason for it. Yeah, but that... Uh, that's not affected. <laughs> Richard Bradley has it out on track, who has been absolutely fantastic as he weaves his way through the traffic, not slowing him down at all. Even with the penalty, he has a good gap over Jake Hill of 10.1 seconds at the moment. So you could say that he just needs to to bring it home. <laughs> and But as Alex said, it, it is historic racing, so anything can happen. And we, that's been proven once 
more that that's a Robin more than once. He's obviously another retirement as well in the Brundle car. So several times during this session, but the Hancock and Wakeman car is on the podium at the moment as it stands. And he's still got this battle for what is currently fourth place. And in taking that fourth place, Pat Blakeney Edwards, I think, has actually got it this time. Yes, he has, as they go down the straight. Uh, he has managed to nip past and go into fourth position. That will be confirmed when he comes over the line, of course, on the uh, timing screen. But that's a good effort. And the number three, Aston Martin, has now dropped a down one with Simon Hadfield at the wheel. He fought him off for a good long time, but it uh, didn't quite work to, to fend him off for much longer. It's a bit of a gap to the next car, 5.8 seconds to try and catch the number 11, although that, I think, includes the penalty, presumably, already. But if he could gain uh, over five seconds, there is a chance of still getting a podium out of this. Yeah, there's still a chance, but... The number 11 has just set a personal oh, best yeah. on that last lap, so the track's still clearly improving. Richard Bradley, funny enough, has now totally backed off. He was in the 129s. He's now driving around in the 131, so because he's got nothing to chase and he's pretty safe with his penalty, uh, he's now just out there bringing it home. Still probably going to get it sideways on occasions just to, to, to show off as he still bleeds it right to the edge of the track. But uh, he's, he's pretty safe now. Let's have a look oh. at... Oh, that was a bit of a slide from uh, Sam Hancock. Managed to sort it out well, didn't he? Yeah, and he doesn't want to be doing that because he has got that penalty. So he needs to make sure that he keeps it on the, on the tarmac uh, and pointing in the right direction as it, he comes through the chicane gets close to those tyre barriers on the left-hand side. But what a great sight, Ben. I mean, we can't really see it out of our commentary box window, just about the very tinted windows here. But uh, a lovely sight of these cars driving around this circuit with, the, with their lights on. Yeah. Yeah, great going sight. into darkness. It really is a lovely view. And uh, it's lovely that uh, the fans are still enjoying it, absorbing some beautiful action out there. And what is looking now, despite getting a penalty, uh, so it's going to be a, a comfortable victory for the two Richards, Richard Wilson and Richard Bradley. And it's Richard Bradley who has really delivered superbly, managing to make up for the loss of time even before the sea type went completely wrong. Maybe the sea type was already losing a bit of pace earlier than we realised. Um, and now it's out of the race altogether, of course, Jensen Button's car. Whereas Richard Bradley is now, as you say, going a bit calmer lapping quite consistently but he's got a good advantage over Jake Hill with the Gregor Fiskin car that's now running in second place some 10 seconds behind now they're going to get a, a good result in that one but Richard Bradley this is great news the man in his early 30s who was karting from 11 years old and uh, did the full European karting championships he was based in Bangkok uh, himself though and uh, then went on to win the Formula BMW Pacific Series in 2010 he did Japanese F3 racing, and he did Super Formula in Japan as well, and uh, then he went on to race in GT cars, LMP2 class at Le Mans, taking the, uh, the victory in the class at Le Mans in 2015 in one of the Orica Nissans, and uh, he really has had a, a tremendous career with that victory earlier this year in the Nuvolari Trophy here at Goodwood. And now he's going to back it up with one of the Revival. He is definitely a master around this circuit, isn't he? I remember watching that race. I think we were commentating on that race, weren't we, Ben? It was a, a great display from Richard and uh, really showing off his talents, and especially around this circuit as well. But he can take it a little bit. He's only doing very consistent lap times, even with the traffic, even backing off. He can break a little bit early, he can change the gears slightly earlier just to save the engine and not put anything at risk. Just to make sure that he brings the car home because him and uh, Jake Hill there in second place are, are doing very similar lap times and there's nothing to risk. And the, the team will be showing that for sure on the pit bull. Yeah, absolutely right. And it looks as though the, uh, the podium is going to go the way uh, still of another pen penalised car, uh, the car that Sam Hancock is... It's a penalty podium, isn't it? Yes, yeah, a penalty podium. There are going to be two, two uh, sets of drivers, two pairs of drivers, who end up with a penalty, but still end up on the podium, which is quite impressive. Um, but it looks as though that is going to be the way it is. And we've got the time ticking away. Um, 
think he's going to get over the line just before the checkered flag comes out. It's going to be quite, quite close. They got the timing wrong on the pit stops. <laughs> Hopefully the timing won't go wrong at the end of the race. No, let's have a look. I think it will be, uh, it'll be close. He's coming into Woodgut Corner now, so he's gone through the middle sector, and usually the last sector is around about 24 seconds. So. Uh, this is going to be close. I think he's just about with a, around about seven seconds, I'm guessing, left on the clock. There we go. He crosses the line. So this will be our final lap. Yeah, we're on to it. We're on to the last lap here. And it's the number 78 car that's on target for victory. The 1957 Maserati 250S being driven by Richard Wilson initially. And now Richard Bradley, who has set some very, very impressive lap times chasing down the Jaguar C-Type of Alex Buncombe and Jensen Button that sadly has now retired from the race completely because there was something going wrong with the C-Type. But nonetheless, Richard Bradley hunted down the C-Type while it was still out there, moved ahead. Then we gathered he'd got a penalty because they came into the pits too early. There was a, a strict limit of when you were allowed to come in the pits. They came in just a few seconds early. They got a 10-second penalty. Looked like they weren't going to get the victory, but that's not the truth. They are going to earn the victory as long as he can make it round the final part of the lap. I know, it's, it's not near the end yet, but a great display of uh, great driving. And hats off to Richard Wilson as well. He got it off the line and he made a place, didn't he, over the 55 car of Nigel Webb as he's coming down the back straight now, Levant straight and heading into Woodgut Corner. And a few more corners now to navigate. And he's going to bring the Maserati home to uh, a great victory. Into the chicane for the final time. Richard Bradley in the Maserati 250S takes victory in the Freddie March Memorial Trophy at Goodwood. The first race of this 2023 revival weekend and a dramatic race as well. Doing it with a 10 second penalty, he has still managed to take right victory second place is going to Gregor Fiskin and Jake Hill the touring car star who's done a good job the gap just under 10 seconds in the end even with the 10 second penalties that means he's effectively 20 seconds ahead um, are in the win but nonetheless getting a good podium finish and then we'll just get confirmation in a moment of who finishes in third as they cross the line it looks as though it is going to be uh, Sam Hancock I think it's going to be Sam Hancock uh, sorry, uh, yeah, in the number 11 car, uh, Sam Hancock and Fred Wakeman. I think they're going to end up with that third place. But what a great victory by Richard Wilson and particularly Richard Bradley, who drove that second stint.